I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn over to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, is where we're going to be looking here in just a moment. Before we do, though, we want to take this opportunity to, as we normally do and multiple times throughout our worship services we do, we welcome everybody here. We especially welcome our visitors here. We're excited that we're able to come, we're able to worship God, and we're excited that we're able to see new faces. Excited that we're able to see that it's not just the same people who want to hear God's word, but there's more. And that's an exciting and edifying thing for each and every one of us. Now, if you remember last week, I spoke on our best life. And as I spoke on our best life, it was... It was in regards to the fact we can't have it if we don't have God. Tad mentioned something to me following the the services, and he said that it went along well with another lesson he heard on being content. Well, this morning, we're going to look at being content. And the reason is, is I thought it fit really, really, really well. And I was so happy that he brought that up. You see, when we talk about being content, that's something kind of difficult in our world for us. It can be really hard for us to actually be content in our life. Why? Why is it so difficult? Well, much like you see this girl who, who has this cup and the water's falling over and the cup's already full. Our lives are very much the same. Our cups become full and we have everything that we need. But yet we live in this first world country And just because we have what we need, we still want more. We want that new phone that comes out. We want that new car. My car might be X years old, but it still drives well. I want something new. We might want that new technology. We all know that I love my technology. But why do we really need it? You see, the point is, is that we always want something more, when we will. I see this at work, where one person started with stocks. And what ended up happening is that this one person started there, but everybody else saw it. And so they wanted it. And they thought, I want to be a part of that. I want to have this game. They weren't content. Well, they were. And so they saw, well, maybe I can have more. This morning, that's why we're looking at our best life. But we're looking at it with the, the only idea of being content. Being content in this life. I don't often like to start with definitions. I don't like starting there, but this morning, that's where I do want to start. I want to start by defining what does it mean for us to be content. The definition is this. It's in a state of peaceful happiness. A state of satisfaction. You see, we are really content. Or at least we can be. But the scripture isn't silent on this either. We can look at the definitions. We can look at these things. But the scripture still tells us the same. It still tells us that we need to be content. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, a phrase from that verse says this be content with such things as you have you can see the same type of phrase the same type of thing when you look over in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11 Paul writing to the church at Philippi says for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content but you know what there's a problem and this problem is that we too often will just pull a phrase out. And we'll say, see, in Hebrews 13, it tells us that we need to be content. Done. Or Philippians chapter 4, it says, no matter what state we're in, we need to be content. Done. Why is that a problem? It's a problem because we end up with the wrong attention. We end up with our attention going one place and the scriptures going somewhere else. I think about it with regards to a magician. Their whole job, their whole purpose, their life 
is based around making sure they can send the wrong attention. Hey, look over here while my hand behind my back is pulling out that cup that I'm about to make up here, right? That's what they do. That's what happens when we look at a verse and we pull out a phrase and we say, see, this is what it's teaching me. It's teaching me to be content with the things that I have. This morning, we're going to look more at this. We're going to look more at, is it teaching us to be content with the physical things in life? Or is it teaching us to be content with the spiritual things? Now, as we continue on and we look at what it means for us to be content, let's start in Hebrews. We're going to go back to this verse that we pulled the phrase from, but instead of pulling that phrase, let's read what it actually tells us. Hebrews chapter 13, and let's begin in verse 5. He says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, I'm not going to disagree and we're going to look at it in a moment. I believe he's talking about us being content with the physical things that we have. But let's explain it. In order to explain it, let's start at let your conduct be without covetousness. What's that telling us? Well, it's very simple. We know what it means for us to covet something. We know what it means for us to be covetous. It means that we have this strong desire for what somebody else has, right? It's a pretty simple concept. But why is it that we find it telling us to not covet in the same area that it's telling us to be content. Well, because one goes against the other, doesn't it? When we begin to covet over what somebody else has, what ends up happening is that we think we are not content. We think that we are not satisfied with the things that we have. We think the things that we have aren't enough. Takes us back to that first world problem. That we think that our life is defined not by the things which matter, but by the things of this world. By the things that are here, by our car that we drive, by the phones that we have, whatever, the tech, whatever you want to use. And when we begin to covet on things, that's what happens. We're not content because we think that we're defined by something else. You know what I find really interesting when we talk about covenant? We bring it up and we use it because it's, it's objects that we might covet. Israel coveted something different. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8. Verses 4 and 5. Samuel writes, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. What did the elders come to Samuel and say? They came and said, We want to be like everybody else. What were they coveting? They were coveting wanting to be like everybody else, weren't they? Coveting is not something new. Matter of fact, it's never going to be something new. It's something in our nature that we want more. There's something in our nature that tells us, I want more. We're going to look in a moment why that's not really a bad thing. Why it's not a bad thing that our nature says, I want more. But it was for the Israelites. It was for the Israelites because when they coveted these things, when they coveted and wanted to be like the other nations, they weren't content with the things that they had. They weren't content with what they were given on this earth. So let's ask this question again. Is he talking about the physical things 
Or is he talking about the spiritual things? When we look at it, we might think that it's one or the other. But it's really not. It's really not that it's talking about one thing or the other. It's talking about how one thing goes along with the other. When we realize that I have enough physical things, and we realize that not because we were this profound human, but we realize it because I don't need them. I realize I don't need the physical because I have the spiritual. That's what we see the Hebrew writer talking about. Talking about the fact that when we, when we covet on these earthly things, it's taking our attention away from the spiritual things. And there is no way, no possibility for us to live our best life if we're focused physically. It's not going to happen. But let's look at this being content physically because of the spiritual. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Why is it the Hebrew writer says that he was able to say this or that he was able to be content? Well, let's go back to Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. More specifically, the latter part of verse 5. What he says is this. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why are we able to be content physically? Well, because God has been the same God from the beginning. From the beginning, when he told Jacob the same thing. In Genesis chapter 28 and verse 15, when he said, Behold, I am with you. And will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. He is the same God who had Moses, and Moses was able to tell all of Israel the words of the Lord. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6. When he says, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He's able to say this and be content physically because it's the same God who told Joshua the same thing as well. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Is the point sunk in yet? That the only way we can actually be content physically is when we make the realization that I have something better already. I can be content physically be content with the junky car we might drive and the house that gives us shelter and keeps us safe, but might not be as nice as somebody else's. I can be content in whatever the case may be, because why? Because I have a God who is with me and who tells me he's not going to leave me nor forsake me. We get so focused on the wrong things that we forget about the right things. We forget about the fact that we are able to boldly say, remember this is boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Are we content physically? Are we content physically because all of these other things don't matter? Because my attention isn't on them. You know, when we talk about uh, being content because of the spiritual, I can't help but think about the Beatitudes. 
I can't help but think about Matthew chapter 5. And you might be thinking, Jason, it never says the word content when we look at what we call the Beatitudes. But it definitely gives us the idea. It definitely gives us this teaching. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. It says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I mentioned just a minute ago that it's not a bad thing that we want more. It's not a bad desire that we need more. Because when we're humbled enough on this earth, humbled enough to realize that these aren't the things I need, that these aren't the things that matter, and that turns in and, and become, becomes that hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're able to replace this earthly physical need to have more. And we're able to replace it with the desire, with the need to have more spiritually. And when we talk about being content on this earth, we think too physically and not enough spiritually. The only way that we can live our best life is when we realize that things on this earth don't really matter. When we realize that no matter what happens, God's going to help me make sure I have my food, I have my clothing. He will take care of me. And then I can know. Then I can be content. I want to look at one more verse. One more verse that we already read just a portion of this morning. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. There it says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You read this passage, and when we focus on being content, we look at it and we say, well, Paul tells us, no matter what state we're in, that we need to be content in that state. And he does. But there's something else. There's something else that he's teaching us about us being content. He's teaching us that it's a learned trait. Being content is not something that we wake up one day and all of a sudden we have it. It's not something where we believe and we're baptized and all of a sudden we're content. The only way for us to be content is to learn to be content. Over in Romans chapter 12, in verse 2, we turn over here so often. And we do so rightly because it tells us there, it says not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing or renewal of your mind. But what does it say after that? So we know that part. After that, it says this, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know what that word prove means? It means that we discern it. It means that we learn it. We have to learn what is the will of God. Just like we have to learn how to be content. Because his will is definitely for us to be content. To be content with the physical things, knowing of something better. This morning, I want to end 
in the same verses that we began. But as we do so, and we look at being content, and we see how it is a trait in our life, a trait that aids us to the best life we have, I want to end in Hebrews 13, verse 6, where he says, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know why it is that we are able to learn to be content? We're able to learn because we have the strength available. We're able to learn because we have these things at our disposal. We just have to be the ones willing to grab them. We have to be the ones willing to search for them, to read of them, to learn of them. I was reading something, and we all know how much I don't like Facebook, but sometimes it's, it brings something up that I like. And it brought up this analogy. The analogy was that fish, when, when God wanted fish, he spoke to the sea. When God wanted trees, he spoke to the earth. When God wanted man, he went to himself. Over in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the beginning part says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. When we talk about being content, I want to ask this final, final question. Are we content in God? Are we content in knowing, as we mentioned in our Bible class this morning, knowing that the Almighty, the one who is eternal, the one who has always been, the one who is everything, are we content in knowing that He made this earth so that we might walk on it, bring glory to Him, that He sent His Son, that He can make us righteous through His blood. Are we content in these facts? Are we content to know these things? To live our life believing these things? Because if we are, then all we have to do is obey. All we have to do is let those things be what resonate in our mind. Because when God is first in our mind, when God is first in our life, we will live our best life. But when He is not, our life will be sad. It just will. We might not think it while we're here. We might not think that, that having 18 sports cars in a $4 million mansion is a sad thing. But it is. It is when it's misplaced. It is when it's the wrong attention. My question this morning is, are you in Christ? Have you come to Christ? Have you been baptized? Have you been added to His body? If you have, then that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But if you haven't, I ask why. If we know that we need to be baptized, we know that we need these things, why have we waited? Or maybe we, we didn't wait. We've been baptized, and yet we find we've fallen away. We've been distracted by the earthly things that have taken us away from God. If you need to come forward and make things known in a public manner, we ask you to do so. Or if you need to come forward for prayers. And the Church of Christ is a small, small community. One where we know a lot of people. Do we use that? Do we take advantage of this community that we have? This spiritual community. Because if we need prayers 
we can use that community. If you need prayers, if you need to be baptized, if you need to make things right in a public way, we ask you to please come forward as we stand and as we sing.